Hello everyone and welcome to another Foolish Fish Esoteric Saturday video. I want to talk about dragons today. I'd made a video in the past about serpents, snakes, but dragons, well, while they're quite related to serpents, they are kind of different. Now, I'm not going to go into the differences between the whole Eastern dragon and Western dragon thing, the whole Welsh versus Chinese versus whatever other form of dragon that you can think of. That's actually been done to death, and you'll actually be able to find many, many YouTube videos on that topic. So no, today I want to talk about dragons from the perspective of initiation and also from the perspective of symbolism in the West. Now I want to bring this up because this is yet another really interesting point on the Calendaria Magicum Perpetuum, which I'm currently translating. You know that in the last video I showed you that table with all the planetary hours laid out. Well, actually on that same line, there are two words that appear, caput draconis and cauda draconis, the head and the tail of the dragon. And then if you follow that line along, you can see these strange looking glyphs, these strange little shapes that I've not seen in any other grimoire or manuscript. And that's not to say that they're not out there, of course. Well, the Caput Draconis and the Cauda Draconis are aspects that I've come across in two different disciplines, astrology and geomancy. Let's talk about astrology first. The head and the tail of the dragon are two spots in the sky. These two spots are called the lunar nodes and they move around in the sky a little bit. It takes about 18 and a half years for them to move all the way around. We call it a draconic year, 18 and 18.6 years, something along those lines. And draconic, of course, means of the nature of the dragon. It's from the Latin draco. So what are lunar nodes? I need to take you back to a geocentric perspective. Back in the day, of course, before Copernicus, people imagined the planet Earth to be central to the universe and everything else proceeding around it. Now, from that perspective, of course, the sun was revolving around the planet Earth once every day. However, that was the case for all of the stars. Of course, if planet Earth is revolving once a day, then everything else seems to revolve around it once a day. If we're imagining the planet Earth as being static and everything else moving. So it wasn't the fact that it was revolving around the Earth once a day that was interesting. It was the fact that the Sun and six other planets, they were called planets as the Wanderers, seem to be also moving along this background, right? So every day as we came back to see the sun, or when the sun came back, should I say, it seemed to have moved a little bit from its background, right? So it was moving very fast, of course, it was moving all the way around once a day. But from the perspective of the background, it seemed to have moved. Every time it came along, it seemed to have moved a little bit further along. And of course, the 12 constellations that the sun moved along would be the 12 zodiacal signs, the 12 signs of the zodiac. And it would reach a new zodiac sign approximately every month, at least on average every month. Obviously, some of the constellations are a bit smaller and some of the constellations are a bit larger. And the same was noticed of the moon. The moon was also moving along its background actually quite significantly faster than the sun. The moon would actually go all the way around its ellipsis once every 28 days. But the sun's ellipsis and the moon's ellipsis weren't exactly the same. The moon had a slight angle compared to the sun. And so the spot where the moon's ellipsis intersected with the sun's ellipsis on one side and on the other side were known as the head and tail of the dragon. If you can imagine a very large dragon traversing the planet Earth, and yeah, at the, those points in the sky, the points where the moon's ellipsis and the sun's ellipsis crossed in the north was the head of the dragon, and where it crossed in the south was the tail of the dragon. But why of the dragon? Well, Obviously, people had noticed that the moon had phases, right? So new moon, waxing crescent, first quarter, waxing gibbous, full moon, 
waning gibbous, third quarter, waning crescent, and back to new moon. Whenever the moon was in its head or tail node, if it was a full moon, the moon would turn red. And that was whether it was in the head or the tail of the dragon. Because obviously that's what happens when there is a lunar eclipse. And if the moon reached one of its nodes and it was a new moon, then there would be a solar eclipse. Now actually, lunar eclipse and solar eclipses happen as often as each other. Of course they do. It's just that a lunar eclipse can be seen from the entire planet. A solar eclipse can only be seen from the place on Earth where the shadow from the moon is being cast. And for that to be in a populated area, it has to be kind of lucky. It doesn't happen quite so often, right? You'll regularly get solar eclipses in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And because they only last for a few minutes, it's very quickly done. And just nobody was there to see it. Now, solar eclipses were a terrifying event for people. Especially if it doesn't happen very often for people, you can imagine how terrifying it would be to see the sun, the source of life, the thing that helps your crops grow, your source of light and warmth during the day just disappearing. Something looking like a black smoke taking over the golden disk in the sky and just everything going silent and deathly. Those would be terrifying moments in your life. And so a galactic dragon with its head in one node and its tail in the other would make sense symbolically. So now let's talk a little bit about geomancy. I find it fascinating that this head and tail of the dragon have found their way into this Western divinatory system that really has very little to do with astrology. For those of you for whom geomancy is a new concept, I like to think of geomancy in terms of a Western form of the I Ching. That's a gross simplification, naturally. However, there are some parallels. For example, in the I Ching, you build up a hexagram, six lines. Some of the lines will be single lines. Some of the lines will be cut up into two lines. So starting from the bottom, you'll have a series of six lines with a value of one or two. And then once you've built up your hexagram, you can look up the meaning of that particular hexagram. In Geomancy, it's not a hexagram, but a tetragram that you build up. It's got only four levels, but all of the information is not contained in that one tetragram the way it is with the I Ching. Here, you're building a whole tableau of tetragrams, and depending on which of the 16 possible tetragrams lands in the individual spots of the board that you're creating, it's going to interact with the tetragram that's just next to it and so on. It's actually quite complex, and mathematicians tend to really like this system of divination. And well, two of those tetragrams have those names, the tail of the dragon and the head of the dragon. And interestingly, they have quite a similar significance as the head and tail of the dragon in astrology do. The caput draconis and the cauda draconis. So let's talk about the head first of all. In astrology, the head of the dragon represents areas in your life that are there for you if you only reach out for them. It's the potential in your life. It's the parts of your life that could be developed if you can find the willpower to reach out in that direction. When a planet reaches that node, whether the moon is there or not, or whether the sun is there or not, it doesn't matter. That spot in the sky where they will meet is the node. And when a planet is conjunct with the head of the dragon, it increases the effect of that planet. So it's believed that if a benefic planet reaches that north node, the uh, the head of the dragon, then the effects, the, the happy effects, the good effects of that planet will be significantly increased. But if a malefic planet reaches that node, then its evil effects will also be increased. Naturally, the reverse is true for the tail of the dragon. Any good planets reaching there, its effects will be dampened, and in the same way, any malefic planet will be um, calmed down as well by the tail of the dragon. Now, when we consider the geomantic meanings of the head of the dragon, we suddenly get things like beginnings, 
initiations, uh, the, the spark that starts things off. So very similar to that idea of um, the potential of what's out there if we only reach out for it. Maybe the idea in astrology is a little bit earlier in the process than it is in geomancy where it actually represents the beginning of things. And in astrology it represents what comes just before the beginning. And the beginning can only happen if you decide to go out and get it. Now the tail of the dragon in astrology represents those habits that have settled in your life. The good habits, but also the bad habits. It's the thing that you go to naturally by default. These are the patterns that you get into at an early age and that are very difficult to get out of at an older age. Sometimes those are patterns that you can really lean into and they'll be really great for you because they happen naturally for you. But sometimes they're going to be quite destructive patterns and those are the ones that are going to be quite difficult and challenging to get away from because, once again, they happen naturally. So in Geomancy, the Cauda Draconis, the tail of the dragon, is related to endings and that can be a good thing if an ending is desired, of course, and it can be a bad thing if the ending is something that you're trying to avoid. In Geomancy, the Cauda Draconis, or the Tail of the Dragon, represents endings. Obviously, that can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. When you're talking about a positive situation, it's not going to be a good thing. You don't want a positive situation to end. But if you're talking about a situation that is maybe troublesome, then the Cauda Draconis represents precisely its, its end. So as much as the caput, the head of the dragon, might be thought of a little bit like maybe the fool card from the tarot, the cauda draconis might be thought of as the death card, the end of cycles and a very Saturnian energy. You, know, you remember in last video we said that Saturn can be a scary aspect of life to work with and yet it is an absolutely necessary one. Now it's interesting for me to see that the Cauda Draconis, the tail of the dragon, a firm double dot at the base and then the rest of the three positions has got a single dot. So you've got this very stable structure and that to me really reminds me of the meaning of the tail of the dragon in astrology which is this thing that uh, is not toppled over. It can't be toppled over. It's precisely the thing that is so deeply ingrained that it just happens automatically, naturally. It is the most stable structure in our life, whether we like it or not. So all of this got me thinking about the dragon as a symbol of transformation, moving from the head of the dragon to the tail of the dragon, from the beginnings to the ends, from the initiation to adepthood. And well, Andrew Chumbly's The Dragon Book of Essex is a book that has been out of my financial reach for a very long time. It's completely out of print, very difficult to find, and yet it's uh, very, very well respected in the industry, particularly by traditional witchcraft practitioners. But Peter Hamilton Giles from Atramentus Press has just been creating these books uh, recently called The Book of the Black Dragon. At the time that I'm recording this, there are only two of the books of the Black Dragon that have been published. There are three planned. And I have to say, I really like this idea of placing the initiation of this Book of the Black Dragon upon the parts of the body of the dragon. I obviously can't speak for what will happen in the third part, the third book of this trilogy, but um, I can certainly see a pattern emerging where the first book is about the head of the dragon and then the, the second book is a little further down the body and then we'll finally get to the tail in the final book. And I also like the idea in alchemy that the dragon is quicksilver. Now, quicksilver is not quite the same thing as mercury. Quicksilver is a philosophical metal and it's supposed to contain spirit. Now, the dragon represents the quicksilver. The dragon represents the container of spirit. And it makes sense if the dragon represents the whole thing from beginning to end. We've got this Ouroboros idea, which is a serpent, of course, but I've certainly seen Ouroboroses with wings. And so the dragon can be said to be a recipient, a container for spirit. 
or should I say a container of spirit. And of course that makes great sense, doesn't it? Because the dragon represents air from the fact that it flies. It represents fire naturally, right? The fire that it breathes. It represents the earth from the mountains within which it lives. And of course it represents water, the, the reptilian aspect of it, uh, the, the fluid movements and so on. And of course in the East, the dragons are directly associated with water, aren't they? So yes, all in all, a very beautiful symbol. Have I missed anything out? Le leave a comment down below about your thoughts on dragons or maybe your researches on dragons. I'd be fascinated to find out what you think. In the meantime, I really want to say thank you to all of the members who have been supporting my channel for so long now. I, I really can't tell you how grateful I am to all of you for keeping this channel alive. The fact that I'm able to just create video after video and I have so much fun doing it and um, I think that there's at least some value in these videos. I, I feel like uh, so many of you reach out to me to let me know that you're actually enjoying them or even that you're learning something from them, which is even even more wonderful, isn't it? Um, and I, I just want to say that without members, these videos would never still be going. And uh, whether you're a member through the YouTube memberships or whether you're a member through Patreon, I, I just want to say thank you so, so much. Now, obviously a massive, massive thank you to all the level Infinity members. David Venturini, Aritz Murueta Ramos, Caitlin Kopok, Amon, Linda Hendricks, Rhonda Starkey, Stephen Hunter, and the Eldritch Keeper. Thank you so, so much. Your support really means the world to me and my family. Thank you. And also to the level three members whose names you can see scrolling over here on the left of your screen. And if you enjoyed the video, please remember to leave a thumbs up. It, clicking on that like button really, really helps not just this video, but the entire channel. And to subscribe if you haven't subscribed already and if you'd like to see more videos like this one, of course. Do remember that I also do one-to-one -one video consultations. You can ask me to read your tarot or read your I Ching. Alternatively, we can just have a nice conversation about whatever topic you would like. All the links for that are down in the pinned comment and also in the description of the video. Thank you ever so much for watching. Take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and see you very soon with another video. Bye-bye.